All right, folks, we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Um, I wanted to just take a, a couple of seconds here to uh, point out a few things for you. I, uh, Mary Ellen had asked for some of those resources and gave me an opportunity to uh, uh, mention to you our wonderful database of resources through carolinak12.org. Um, and I also just wanted to bring to your attention just the incredible work that we do. You know, um, right now our, our society is in a crisis in which we don't know how to talk to each other. We don't know how to think about difficult ideas and how to incorporate those into our self, sense of self and our sense of community. Um, we believe that humanities are the, uh, the cure, if you will, the absolutely necessary um, initiative that we take to make sure that we are encouraging humanistic re uh, reflection and dialogue in as many places as we can. And the most important place we can do that is in our uh, K-12 schools and to support our K-12 teachers. So um, I wanted to just take a moment to say to you, we continue to do that work throughout this past year. I know uh, you folks have paid uh, tuition to come and see today's event, and we thank you so much for that. It helps us support these programs and bring these out, but we could use all the support we could get, folks, to help continue to support our teachers uh, with carolinak12.org. So I wanted to take a moment uh, to suggest to you to consider giving. I know that the in the cosmological world and the calendars of the communities we just saw, they didn't have things like fiscal years. But as our fiscal year comes to an end on July 1st, we could we would love support. Uh, we will use that support to help our community college outreach programs, our K-12 outreach programs, and of course, to support this great programming that you have here as well. So thank you for considering giving to us. Just know that um, every donation that we receive uh, you, uh, it's tax deductible for you and any amount is greatly appreciated and very helpful. So thank you for that. I also wanted to mention again, I mentioned a few upcoming programs. I want to say it's been very great. We have a program called Lunch with Friends and Strangers, which is a, a biography program. And it has been really, really gratifying to be able to do a fair amount of Native American uh, biographies. Uh, and we do have one again, we have Aaron Copeland, not a Native American biography next week, but the week following where we're going to be looking at Darcy McNichol, a, a Native American writer and activist. So keep that in mind. And finally, like I hinted at before, um, we are, we have wonderful programming, go to humanities UNC.edu, but I want to put a pin on June 26, our last Adventures and Ideas seminar of this uh, season, of this summer season, where we will have an opportunity for you to come and uh, attend that live. It's on conceptions of time, looking at this from an interdisciplinary perspective, including physics, religion, and history. Um, and we will be holding this at Silver Spot Theater. If you have purchased a virtual ticket, we, uh, we do ask that you come and purchase the uh, ticket to come live. Uh, we have some costs associated with doing it at the theater and whatnot, uh, but we do hope to see some of you live. It's, it, we, I, we had our first little glimpse of it on Thursday. It was remarkable. Uh, so we hope to uh, see you there live on June 26th. Check all of that out. I've taken too much of our next speaker's time. I promise him I'll give it back on the other side, uh, but let me uh, have uh, Eduardo Douglas turn on your camera and I will introduce our next speaker. Uh, Eduardo Douglas uh, is Associate Professor of Art History here at the University of North Carolina. He received his PhD from uh, the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he is a wonderful writer. Now, I, this is a terrible thing when you have to read someone's book and you know you're going to mess up this uh, pronunciation, but I know Eduardo will help me. Uh, his first book was in the Palace of Netzahuacuatl. Sorry, you're going to figure Netzahuacuatl. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Uh, uh, there, I should have practiced before in painting manuscripts, writing the pre-Hispanic past in the early colonial period, uh, Texcoco, Mexico. So uh, fascinating. I would just say one other thing. Uh, 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 Dr. Douglas uh, worked with us also on a wonderful presentation on the murals of Diego Rivera and other uh, political muralist in Mexico. So uh, a wonderful uh, grasp of the broad history of art history uh, in Mexico, and it's certainly in this pre-Columbian uh, art history. So thank you so much for joining us again, uh, Eduardo, and we have uh, information on you in the chat, and it is this is your forum. Take it away. Thank you, Max. And uh, uh, am I on the screen? What do I need to do? Uh, share, sorry. Yes, we can see you, but you just need to share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, well, while I'm putting things up, um, I 
would like to thank Max for that lovely introduction and thank everyone at Carolina Public Humanities for this invitation to address uh, the audience today, whom I thank for being here. Uh, I am an art historian, so my perspective is slightly different from Vin's. Uh, it is the work of archaeologists that I build on, and I look at Mesoamerica, with most of which, by the way, is part of North America because Mexico is part of North America. Uh, and one of the key differences uh, is that we have writing from pre-Hispanic Mesoamerica, and that means we can do different things from what can be done with cultures north and south of this thing we call Mesoamerica. Now, uh, the work that I have in the background of my introductory slide is this. It's atzompantli. Atzompantli is an Aztec word, which means a skull rack, that is, a rack on which the skulls of sacrificial victims are placed. Here, the Tzompantli is monumentalized, that is, it is transformed into stone, which serves as a type of record or commemoration. And indeed, the work monument comes from uh, the Latin root, which means to remember, uh, to record, uh, it's also related to the Latin word, which means to warn. Uh, and Atzompantli, in a sense, showing the skulls of sacrificial victims is a type of warning. Now, this work from uh, the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, over which Mexico City sits, uh, does indeed uh, commemorate an actual object. Uh, beginning in 2015, the Tzompantli of the great ritual center of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, began to be excavated under uh, colonial period buildings. We have here on the left a graphic uh, that was published in Science Magazine uh, in 2018 as the uh, excavations continued, and they continue today, reconstructing the actual Tzompantli, that is the skull rack with the skulls of human beings, uh, part of which this part here uh, has been in great part excavated. This is uh, what it looks like uh, reconstructed. And as you can see, it's a major, major monument. It's 36 meters across, five meters high, 14 meters deep. Uh, and just the little section that has been excavated has brought us uh, already over 600 human skulls. Now, I'm going to return to that, but before I do, I want to situate us. We're in Mesoamerica, uh, the, which is basically from here to here. And Mesoamerica is a term that was created. It means Middle America. And it was created to refer to a region of cultural traits, a region filled with numerous peoples, uh, numerous languages uh, that goes through time. But what joins them together are cultural traits. And I am going to look at some of those traits today in terms of monuments. These traits join these people across this area and differentiate them from those to the north and those to the south, although aspects of these cultures move back and forth. Now, Mesoamerica is generally divided between Eastern Mesoamerica, the Maya peoples, and Western Mesoamerica, the Mexican civilizations. And I'm going to start with Western Mesoamerica with the Aztecs. Uh, the 
Aztec Empire, which was the empire, the greatest empire of Mesoamerica and the great state in place when the Spaniards arrived uh, in 1519 in mainland Mexico uh, and met these people is misnamed. Uh, Aztec is not a, a word that they used. Uh, we use it today and I use it for convenience. It's really a triple alliance, an alliance among three important cities in the Valley of Mexico. Uh, and the Aztecs, as you see on this chronology, dominate central Mexico and the late post, oops, sorry about that. I always have trouble with that. In the late post-classic period, which runs from about 1200 to 1519, the year of the arrival of the Spaniards. And the Aztecs themselves, uh, the Aztec capital Tenochtitlan begins in 1325. So really they are the very end of the Mesoamerican sequence of high civilization, which generally is placed uh, from about 1500 BCE, that is high civilization, not peopling, not uh, farming, so forth and so on, but high civilization, and we'll get to that uh, eventually, runs from about 1500 BCE to the present, because these peoples are still with us. Many of these languages are still with us, and many of these uh, beliefs and customs are still with us. Now, uh, the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, uh, which I have marked out with a red arrow in the right-hand uh, map, is a city built on islands in the center of the Valley of Mexico uh, in a group of five lakes, most of which have disappeared. Uh, Mexico City has been built over them. At the center of Tenochtitlan, is the sacred precinct where we find the Zompantli, that is the skull rack. And I want to look at Tenochtitlan and its sacred precinct as a way to begin to think about these larger patterns. Before I do, I want to point out that in the right-hand so slide, uh, you see two towns, Tlacopan and Pescoco, uh, one at the left, Tlacopan, and Texcoco at the right, which are in bold. Those two cities with Tenochtitlan are what make up the Triple Alliance. It's the alliance among those three cities out of which the Aztec Empire is created, and Tenochtitlan serves as the main capital. If we look uh, at Tenochtitlan uh, and look at how it is represented by indigenous artists in about 1540, so after uh, the so-called conquest, uh, as a left, I show you a folio from what's known as the Codex Mendoza, which was, we think, commissioned by the first Spanish viceroy from indigenous painters. And on this page, we see the founding of Tenochtitlan, which was said to take place in 1325. Uh, what is of interest here is the way in which the artist represents it. At the center, he has the symbol of the city, the uh, rock out of which grows a prickly pear cactus on which sits an eagle. This was the vision that the patron deity of the Mexica of Tenochtitlan, the most important people of the Aztec empire, gave them when he asked them to leave their homeland north and migrate until they saw this vision and there settle. So that is the symbol, that is the beginning. The key thing is that the city in its plan and the representation in its design 
have a center and four quarters. This is a very important pattern in Mesoamerica. It is often referred to as the quincunx, uh, the five point design. I show you here with a detail of the Mendoza at the left and the map of Tenochtitlan at the bottom right, a page from a pre-Hispanic manuscript known today as the Codex Fejevadi Mayer. It is one of 16 pre-Hispanic manuscripts that survives. It is in the uh, logographic pictorial system of central Mexico. It comes from central Mexico in the late classic period. What it shows us is creation. At the center is the creation creator deity. We have the four cardinal directions, east at the top, west, north, and south. The deities associated with each direction, the world trees associated with each direction, the days of the ritual calendar, and I should explain, the ritual calendar is one of the primary cultural traits that unifies Mesoamerica. It is a calendar of 20 named days that cycle with the numbers one through 13, 260 days. It is only used in Mesoamerica. It doesn't occur north of Mesoamerica or south of Mesoamerica. It's one of these fundamental traits that we find almost from the beginning that goes all the way through. It's still used today in some very traditional communities by uh, men who divine the future. So in this image, we have a representation of space and time at creation. At the center is the creator deity, in this case known as uh, the old, old god, way, way the old. Uh, he is fed by blood from sacrifice because it is sacrifice and indeed the sacrifice of the gods themselves that creates the world. This is a very specific worldview it is a way of communicating an idea of how things happen and when they happen. Uh, now, in Western Mexico, we see this pattern uh, very, well, we see it all over Mesoamerica very early on, but in Western Mexico, it's unique because the cities, are organized, the imperial cities are organized in this pattern. And I use the word cities uh, with full confidence because for example, Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, probably had a population of close to 200,000 when the Spaniards arrived, which was bigger than any city in Europe at the time, except for Constantinople. Uh, now, these are major, major cities, major states, monarchies. I point here to the predecessor of Tenochtitlan, uh, Tula, which is probably the furthest north of the major sites in Mesoamerica. Uh, and it dates to the period just before Tenochtitlan and indeed it's Tenochtitlan and the Aztecs who uh, may have destroyed Tula uh, around 1150 when the peoples who become the Aztecs are migrating into central Mexico, probably from what today is the southwest of uh, the US. Uh, I should say that the language of the Aztecs, Nahuatl, uh, is part of a, the larger Udo Aztecan language family in which many of the indigenous languages of the US 
to which many of the indigenous languages of the US belong. Uh, I show you here the larger plan of Tula only so that you can see this fundamental pattern, a north-south axis, an east-west axis, at the center of which is the ritual center, the greatest temples and the royal palaces. This is an important and really, uh, what's the wor best word uh, to use? Uh, it's a pattern that communicates much to indigenous peoples and that say something about how the rulers and the state see themselves. Even before Tula uh, in the great city of Teotihuacan, uh, the greatest city of the classic period and one of the earliest imperial cities, we have the same pattern uh, and Teotihuacan, exists from the late formative, that is the period moving from before the common era to the common era to about 600. Although we think by probably 450, 500, uh, it had collapsed. The center of the city had been sacked. Uh, the state that it uh, controlled had fallen apart and it controlled a very large region because we see its influence all across Mesoamerica. The point here too is that this city, north-south axis, east-west axis, and at the center of it, the most important temple, the most important royal building uh, in what is known as the Ciudadela, there are bigger temples, the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon, which is the pyramid you see uh, behind the uh, announcement for this seminar. But again, center four directions. And in fact, for the Aztecs, uh, Teotihuacan, and they gave uh, the that name to this site. We don't know what the uh, peoples who created it called it or themselves. We don't know what language they spoke. The Aztecs called this Teotihuacan, which means uh, place of the gods. And in Aztec cosmology, it is here that the gods sacrifice themselves to create being, to create the center and the four directions to create the sun, to create the moon, sacrifice creation. Uh, and here's the center where the temple of the feathered serpent is what records this power. We, I'm not going to go into this temple because I'm much more interested in the Aztec, uh, but I show this to you so that you can see that there's this long tradition of organizing things in a specific way. And that way relates to ideas about how the world comes about and the relationship between those in power and the divine. In Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, uh, the great ritual center uh, marks the center of creation. I show you on the left, the reconstruction model of the Templo Mayor precinct. And Templo Mayor means main or great temple in Spanish. That's what we, the term we use for this great central precinct. Uh, and on the right, a plan of the precinct. Uh, at the most important building in the plan is the great temple itself. And as you can see, the ritual center is surrounded by royal palaces. Uh, 
this was the center of power. This was where everything happened. Now, to give you a sense of the scale, because the center of Tenochtitlan, uh, the center of Mexico City sits over Tenochtitlan. Uh, at the left is a detail of the reconstruction model of the temple about which we know quite a bit because we've excavated quite a bit of it. And on the right is an aerial view looking towards the central plaza of Mexico City, the Zocalo, uh, with the great cathedral and an overlay of the Templo Mayor, giving you a sense of its scale. The overlay sits over the excavation site where the temple uh, has been excavated since the late 1970s. It's a very particular sort of temple. It is uh, a step pyramid, which is very much in the traditions of Mesoamerica. Uh, it, it is built in a number of phases. Uh, it is built of stone and it has a, a unique design in the context of Mesoamerica. That is, it has two shrines at the top. This is distinctive of the late post-classic in central Mexico and of the Aztec peoples. Now, the temple has seven phases. We know today that each Aztec ruler, each of the major Aztec emperors, and I show you the genealogy of the emperors or the Tlatoque, which means he who speaks. That's the term used in Nahuatl to refer to the major ruler, he who speaks in the uh, singular, it's Tlatoani. Uh, each of the major rulers rebuilt the temple. It is, the temple is closely associated with each ruler, each reign and the state. And the ruler of course, in life is himself a type of representation of the divine. Now, the key thing in this monumental building is what happens at the top, because basically much of it is a platform for these two shrines. One of the shrines at the top, the one at the north, is uh, dedicated to Tlaloc, the storm and rain god, who exist as long as we can see anything in Mesoamerican cult, art. He is an old god. He, there's always a rain and storm god. He is ancestral. At the south side, there is the shrine to Huitzilopochtli, who is the patron deity of the Aztecs, of the Mexica. He's a new god. He represents uh, the sky, sun, energy, fire, new, old. This is very specific because this building itself in its very structure communicates a message. And that message is at Latinoli, one of the central concepts in Aztec thinking. The word at means water, Latinoli means burnt thing. At Latinoli is what's called a diphrastic metaphor. Uh, that is a metaphor using two terms that contradict each other in many ways, but when brought together generate a third term. In Nahuatl, at Latinoli 
can refer to war, can refer to uh, struggle, can refer to uh, the creation of something through struggle. It is central to the conception of how things come about because for the Aztecs, the gods at Teotihuacan through Aklachinoli self-sacrifice, a, a type of war or uh, effort creates something. War for the Aztecs creates something. The temple as the place and action of Atlachinoli creates something, which for the Aztecs is generally referred to as Donali, Donali, which uh, we might translate as warmth, energy, soul force, war, sacrifice, effort, create soul force. The building uh, that we see, the sculptures that we see at the center of Tenochtitlan, all of this is there to create soul force, to generate energy, to make the state. And indeed, uh, for the Aztecs, Denochtitlan and the temple serve as the very center of creation. That is what keeps the world going. The world created by the gods at Teotihuacan is maintained by the Aztec state through war, through sacrifice, and therefore Denochtitlan, particularly that temple, that manifestation of Atlachinoli is cited at the very center of creation. It's at the point where the vertical and the horizontal planes, if you will, of uh, being meet and in the uh, way of thinking of the Aztecs and many other Mesoamerican peoples, above the central, above the earthly plane, which is uh, often considered as a reptilian floating on water, there are 13 levels, which uh, for the Aztecs end in a place called Omeyocan, which means place of two, of two-ness of Tunis, it's like a diphrastic metaphor. Uh, the underworld has nine layers and it ends at Miklan, place of the dead. Miklan, place of the dead. This is how things happen. This is how things continue. This is energy and the building the sculptures, the rituals, all of this, in a sense, continues it, this process of being, this state of being, and commemorates it, manifests it, materializes it. Now, this way of thinking uh, about the world, is shared through a good bit of uh, Mesoamerica. And as we saw from Professor Seponitis' talk, it has relations to the way in which the indigenous peoples of uh, the American Southeast, US Southeast, uh, thought about the world. I show you uh, on the left, a diagram of the Maya cosmos, where you can see uh, there's a center, which is the great world tree. There are the four directions, underworld below, upper world above. Uh, there is at the center, uh, the great world tree at the very top of which sits Itzamna, 
uh, the creator deity often conceived of as a bird. You can see the relationship between the two. And I show this because I'd like to look at a, something from the Maya world now, another uh, type of monument, if you will, that relates, of course, to what we saw in Tenochtitlan, but gives us a slightly different uh, character, if you will. I would like to look at this. It is the Temple of the Inscriptions, uh, which dates to about 683 CE in Palenque, a Maya site in the state of Chiapas in Mexico. Uh, this building we know quite a bit about. It is extraordinary uh, to say the least. I point out here Palenque, as you can see, it's in Eastern Mesoamerica as opposed to Western. Uh, and what we're looking at dates to the late classic period. Uh, that is the period from 600 to 900 CE. As you can see from this map of uh, the central section of Palenque, the Maya did not organize their cities in the same way. They did not use the grid plan. They had a much more organic uh, patterning of urban spaces, but they communicated similar ideas as we'll see when we look more closely at the temple of the inscriptions. This is a color reconstruction drawing. Uh, and the first thing I need to tell you is that this is not a temple in the sense that the Templo Mayor in Tenochtitlan is. We know that this is built as a funerary pyramid. Uh, it would be the burial site of one of the great kings of Palenque. We'll get to him in a moment. Uh, it has nine levels. Inside, uh, within the pyramid, and what you see here, stairways going down to the crypt, here where the king is buried. This is a representation of the crypt. Uh, this is divided into 13 sections, 9, 13, underworld, upper world. At the top uh, here in the shrine, uh, there are long inscriptions. The Maya wrote quite a bit. And Maya writing is, in many cases, phonetic, logographic. It is the most highly developed writing system of the Americas. And in these inscriptions, we have details of the king, his ancestors, and creation. How the royal family, the dynasty, the city are tied to creation. And this happens throughout many Maya sites. This is uh, the crypt, one of, well, this is a reconstruction of the crypt that you'll see in the uh, Museo Nacional de Antropología in Mexico City, where we have the burial of the king, Kinich Hana Pakal, usually referred to as Pakal the first, one of the great kings. Uh, this is one of the most amazing monumental groups in all of Mesoamerica. Uh, we're going to look at aspects of it to get a sense of what the king is trying to communicate and what the temple communicates. 
I show you here uh, the crypt here, and as you can see, it's highly decorated. There are these great stuccos on the wall, nine, nine altogether, which you see here. These represent the king's ancestors. Uh, we have sacrificial victims here, and the sarcophagus here, and it's that that I would like to look at. This is the sarcophagus lid, one of the great works of Maya sculpture. Uh, and it communicates a very eloquent vision of the world of creation, of rulership, of the relationship between the royal and the divine. I know it's a little hard to read on this, so we can look at it here. We have uh, the figure of the king, Bakal, who is here represented as the maize god. Maize is the staff of life in Mesoamerica. Maize makes Mesoamerica, and the maize god is one of the key divine forces of Mesoamerica. Mesoamerican life is unimaginable without maize. And maize begins early. The early, I think if I remember correctly, probably the earliest found is at the end of the fifth millennium BCE. So it is, Life is unimaginable without maize. The maize god is central to ideas of life creation. Pakal is here represented as the maize god. The, go the king becomes the maize god in death. He's shown here the world tree here the cosmic monster. So this is the center of creation. He is going into uh, what's known as the quadripartite monster. It's a, a bowl of sacrifice. It references sacrifice, self-sacrifice, the giving blood to the gods to maintain creation. Uh, the king and the bowl are going into the open maw of the underworld. So the king as maize god is going into the underworld. This is very much a part of the larger uh, story of the maize god. But it's a story that as with the ideas of um, Donali uh, generated through Atlachinoli in the Aztec world talks about recreation because maize, the dry seed goes into the earth and then comes back as life. It's exactly what we're being told will happen to the king. The king here is cast in this very specific role of creation and creator deity. He's situated in the cosmos. Uh, this is the interior uh, of the sarcophagus. And uh, I show you at the left, a portrait head of Bacal uh, from the burial crypt and his jade mask from uh, the sarcophagus. And the jade for Mesoamericans is the most precious material almost from the very beginning. It represents maize. It represents growth. It represents royalty. It represents God. So the material itself is a type of monument. Now, 
uh, on the sides of the sarcophagus, and I show you here uh, a re reconstruction of the sarcophagus at the site museum. The actual sarcophagus is still in the crypt, which uh, is closed to visitors now. It was not before, uh, and it was quite something to visit. Uh, on the sides of the sarcophagus, we have representations of the king's ancestors who have all died, but they're shown here coming out of the earth, being reborn as the new maize plant. They are coming back like the maize god. The king manifests the maize god. His death brings new life. Uh, and that is central to Mesoamerican conceptions of how things come about, how things continue. We can see uh, it elsewhere in Maya art, and uh, I show you here a plate from uh, the late classic period. It's actually in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, so if you're ever there, uh, you should go look at it. It's gorgeously, gorgeously painted. It's known as a codex style ceramic because uh, the colors used, red, black, and white, are the colors often used in Maya codices. Uh, what it shows us is the actual maize god, uh, Hunapu, also one Ahau. Ahau is a word for Lord. It's also the first of the 20 days of the ritual 260 day ritual calendar. He's here reborn out of the shell, the turtle shell that represents the earth. Here's the reptilian front of it. And he's reborn through the efforts of his two sons, Hunapu and Chpalanke, the hero twins. These twins who are go to the underworld to bring their father back. And this is something to, to connect with what Professor Stepanidis told us about uh, aspects of tradition in the Southeast. We know a lot about this because of the Popol Vuh, the Book of Council of the Kiche Maya, which gives us uh, the Kiche creation story as recorded in the 16th century after the conquest. And it tells us about the maize god going to the underworld, the maize god dying in uh, the ball court in the underworld, having been tricked by the death deities. His sons go to the underworld eventually and they trick the death deities and bring their father back to life. This is absolutely fundamental. Uh, for the Maya and in other forms for the Mesoamerican world. We can see this early too. Uh, I show you a uh, work on the left that dates to the middle formative period, 900 to about 300 BCE. It's a small uh, work in diopside which re resembles jade. It comes from uh, Rio Pesquero, which is near the great Olmec site of La Venta, which I mark out here. Now, this area here, which is known as the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, where we have the narrowest space between the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean, that is the divider between East and West Mesoamerica. And it is in that area with the people we refer to as the Olmec today, that the traits of larger Mesoamerican cultural traditions begin. Ideas, the calendar, the use of jade, monumental buildings, and so forth. Now, we're talking at this point of this period, the formative or the pre-classic. And La Venta dominates from about 900 to 300. If we 
compare these two, uh, it's perhaps difficult initially uh, to make sense of them because they seem odd to our Western eye. Uh, and they perhaps appear unrelated uh, because they're so different in scale and uh, the way in which the human figure or aspects of the human figure uh, are represented. But in fact, they are related. Uh, this little figurine shows a seated figure who's human, but the seated figure is identified as a ruler by his elaborate outfit, which has iconography on it that connect him as ruler to ideas of the divine. Uh, I show you here a detail of that figurine where you can see that on his headdress, we have references to the quincunx, the center in the four directions. We have at the top, sprouting maize. We have the head of the Olmec supernatural being uh, in this, it's almost certainly the maize god who's shown here with downturned mouth, one of the uh, characteristics of the maize god and almond shaped eyes. This figure, like Bakal at a much later period, serves to connect the king to the maze god and to the larger narrative of creation to communicate the power of the state and the king. Uh, I want to look at a couple more pieces and then I'll um, end. Uh, what I show you on the right is a work from La Venta itself. It's known as Altar Four. It's not an altar, it's actually a throne. Uh, and it too is a royal monument. As you can see, it's basalt, that is stone. It's four, it's almost five feet high. So this is a major, major hunk of stone. And so that you know how complicated it is, the nearest source of basalt is uh, 60 kilometers away. Imagine moving a boulder that size, 60 kilometers without horses, without wagons. This is on the backs of men. This throne shows us the king uh, and shows us the king in a very particular way. If we look at the front, uh, the king is seated uh, cross-legged as in the figurine that we just saw. He's shown in an opening which represents a cave which is a place of creation. He has uh, around him four maize cobs. In a sense, he's the center of the four directions, creation. Above him, a jaguar head. He wears an avian headdress. Jaguars and eagles become major, major symbols of divine powers and creations of night, of day, of earth, of sky, this, they serve almost as a type of uh, diphrastic metaphor. And indeed uh, in the Templo Mayor in Denochtitlan at the other end of the Mesoamerican chronology, the temple itself is flanked on the one side, with the house of the Eagle Warriors and on the other side, the house of the Jaguar Warriors. Very, very important important symbols of ideas of creation. He, the king that is, is shown holding rope. And when we uh, investigate this further, we'll see that uh, this has a very important 
role. On either side of the throne, and the king would have sat up here above his own figure, are captive warriors who are tied with the rope that the king holds. They're about to be sacrificed. They're about to be given up to create energy, uh, to create donali. This is a really key representation of the royal, the divine power creation. Uh, I want to show you one more uh, work from the Olmec world because it does talk to the creation of a type of monumental culture that is tied to a state, tied to rulership, tied to ideas of the divine. Uh, I show you on the right what's known as Colossal Head One from San Lorenzo, which is another Olmec site. Uh, San Lorenzo I mark here, La Venta is here. San Lorenzo is the site associated with the early formative, which is considered the beginning of this thing, this strange monster we call high civilization in Mesoamerica. It is one of a number of huge stone heads representing men, each with a different type of cap that probably served as an identifier uh, of, of the, his identity, his specific identity. Many consider these rulers. These are probably the earliest ruler portraits we have from Mesoamerica, and they're carved on a huge scale. They're meant, like the Templo Mayor, like the Skull Rack, to communicate the idea of power and divine right. Uh, and so that you can see, uh, this is a plan of San Lorenzo with uh, the fine sites of the major stone monuments. Look at all of these ruler heads. Uh, this is the one we just looked at. Uh, and by the way, what you see here is a great mound that uh, 150 feet high uh, and it's man-made down to a level of 23 feet. So this is a huge construction, which was marked with these great stone monuments made from stone that had to be brought from 60 or so kilometers away, representing individual men and their power. This is quite a message to communicate. And I thought I'd leave you uh, with this. This goes back to the Templo Mayor. What I show you on the uh, left is an Olmec mask. You can see how it has some of the aspects of the maze god, the downturned mouth, the almost almond eyes. This mask was excavated in one of the offerings at the Templo Mayor. The Aztecs were very aware of their ancestors. They tried to absorb their power and join it to the Templo Mayor where it plays with the type of power and monumentality represented by the sacrificial victims, one of whose skull you see on the right. This too is from the Templo Mayor, uh, the skull of a sacrificial victim, probably a warrior transformed into a sculpture that references one of the gods of the Aztec, Tezcatlipoca, who is associated with 
rulership and other aspects of Aztec life. They do this in order to keep things going, in order to make things stable because, and I leave you with this, this is one of the poems we have uh, attributed to one of the pre-Hispanic rulers, uh, Netzawalcoyot, as he tells us, quote, I, Netzawalcoyot, ask this, is it true that one really lives on the earth, not forever on the earth, only a little while here, though it be jade, it falls apart, though it be gold, it wears away, though it be Quetzal plumage, it is torn asunder. Not forever on earth, only a little while here, end quote. And it's because of this that we need to remember, that we need to warn, that we need to monumentalize. And I'll leave you with that. Let me see if... Uh... Thank you for that. What a just tremendous uh, uh, overview of that incredible, uh, the cultures that we saw there. Thank you so much for that, Edward. And we see a lot of connections with what we had learned with uh, Vin earlier. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. But let's focus first on some of the questions we have, uh, we have for you. Um, uh, Paul Connick, this is very early on in your talk. Paul Connick had asked, can you tell us what the inscription on the top of the founding of Tenochtitlan graphic says? Uh, he says, I can read cosmographic, but not the rest. And you can feel free to share your screen if you want to pull oh, that up uh, again. Yep, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to it if that will, uh, yeah. hold on just a sec. Uh, because that is, that is actually uh, interesting. Uh, let me go. This gives us all a chance to flash back on all the wonderful images that we saw. Uh, and you jump right to it, I suppose. Yeah. Here we are. Uh, uh, that says Andre for Andre, TV, T H E V E T, cosmographe. Uh, he was the royal cosmographer to the French king. This manuscript ended up in his collection for a time, uh, and <coughs> it uh, he signed it. So this is something European and it gives us an uh, uh, idea of its provenance, but it's not something that was put on the manuscript originally when it was produced in Mexico. Although this manuscript is very interesting because uh, on the recto pages, that is pages that are on your right hand side when the book is open, there is this type of writing, indigenous writing, on the verso pages, pages on your left when your the book is open. Uh, what you see in what to us seems to be an image is translated into Spanish, an alphabetic text. Great, thank you for that. Paul also has a follow-up question. Um, given the focus on temples, it's not surprising that uh, ideograms presented deal overwhelmingly, if not exclusively, on cosmology, cosmogony, and the structure, dynamics, and hier hierarchical rulership of the universe. Are there pictographic or written accounts of everyday life and relationships? Works of literature or what we would call philosophy, that is ethics, epistemology, et cetera? Uh, Big question mark. Um, we have uh, in the Codex Mendoza, which is post conquest, uh, the last section of, of it is a walkthrough through the uh, Aztec life cycle from birth to death with. Uh, aspects of you know what you do at a certain age, what you do if you're a woman, what you do if you're a man, uh, where you study, blah, blah, blah. So you have all that type of information, but that it's post-conquest. Uh, Pre-conquest, uh, we have 16 manuscripts extant. Most of what uh, existed was destroyed. In the 16 manuscripts, uh, there are 
they tend to be uh, dynastic histories, uh, religious, uh, and in the religious ones, we see aspects of what we might call uh, appropriate behavior and how that's tied to larger religious rituals. Um, we have a lot of text uh, written by uh, indigenous scholars in the early colonial period who were writing uh, native languages in uh, the Roman alphabet, giving us ideas of life, but you know how closely it's hard to say. Uh, we can see, for example, in some Maya vase painting, which is something that's produced in the context of royal courts in uh, Maya kingdoms, uh, views of courtly life, everyday courtly life. But again, you know, it's hard to say if, it, if there's anything, I mean, one wants to say yes, but we don't have, we don't have the extent. I, I'm sorry to be so dodgy about that. <laughs> it's the one of the, the um, unfortunate thing about history and trying to do any history is just we have we can only touch what we can see, right? We only have what we have been left back and and that evidence for us. So certainly the archaeology has been very helpful for filling in some of those gaps. But we wish we could go back in time, right? Oh God. <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, Katie Williams uh, asked a question. Uh, she had stepped away right before the All My Heads. She'll catch that on the recordings. But uh, apparently she has heard some ideas and wants to know what are your feelings on the thoughts that the, uh, that the All My Heads are used to show the influence of African explorers in the Americas, that they show uh, an African influence. Um, I'll, just as an aside, I also see some similarities to, say, the heads of Easter Island. Can you speak just a little bit to syncretism or whether it's just Coincidence? Uh, well, for most Mesoamericanists, it's coincidence. Um, a lot of, some would like to see African sources there, but we have absolutely no indication of any uh, connection, actual connection across the ocean uh, between Mesoamerica and Africa before the Spaniards. So, um, you know, it's, it's problematic, uh, I think. There's, uh, there's been nothing yet that uh, has been discovered archeologically that um, demonstrates clearly that there, has, there was interaction between the two. This has just been a fa source of fascination for people like Thor Heyerdahl for years right. trying to be, you know, figure this out. And it certainly is interesting. And it reminds me when Vin was talking earlier about the Bering Strait, that there are those that see some sort of South Pacific connection for South America or whatnot. And I, it's, you always hear little whispers of these things, but they never kind of become canon. Right. And, and there are things, for example, um, in Nahuatl, and, and, and really in, through most of Mesoamerica, but we know it best in Nahuatl, the Aztec language, there's a term atepet, which means water mountain. It's an image, water mountain. That is how you communicate what we mean by polity, by city, by state. Uh, and, you know, it's a term that actually that's what you use to communicate, to say landscape in Chinese. They use the same, they use a metaphor that's used on this side of the Atlantic, but it's, you know, it has a slightly different, but related meaning. Yeah, really yeah, interesting. So. Carl Jung has something to say about it perhaps, but. <laughs> Okay, uh, Liz Moore, I uh, want thanks you for a very interesting lecture and asked, were the burial chambers looted over the years, as were the burial chambers in Egypt? And uh, uh, also, she's surprised that these large heads have remained and not vandalized over the years or the stone broken up to be used in local buildings. 
Um, one of the re well, there are uh, many uh, burials that have been, uh, how shall we put it, sacked. Uh, and probably the greatest uh, thieves of all were the Aztecs themselves, because they went through Teotihuacan, they went through Tula and dug up what they wanted, brought it back to Tenochtitlan. Uh, this happened quite a bit, uh, both in the pre-Hispanic period and more recently from, let's say, the 18th century on, particularly 19th and early 20th century. But that was for a, uh, that was for a different market. It was for a market. Um, the heads, uh, they ended up being buried. And um, there was a lot of uh, overlay. The first head was only excavated in 1945. Uh, and that's the picture that I showed you. It was excavated by uh, the US uh, archeologist, Matthew Sterling uh, and his wife, Marion. Uh, and as the heads have uh, been found in the 20th century, in the context of formal excavations, they have been brought to uh, state museums in Mexico where they're protected. Um, I'm sure if, if looters could get at one, they would, but uh, because they've gotten at any number of other things, but the heads, uh, they have, uh, they're still in public collections in Mexico. And that is because they only began to be excavated in the 40s. And indeed, before the 40s, the Mesoamericanists, many argued that uh, the Maya were the oldest civilization in, in Mesoamerica. We had no idea that things went back so far. Wow. You know, one of the, there was another a part of that question about the repurposing of stone. Were monuments pulled down after the conquest and repurposed? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, all of the time. Uh, there, if you go into some of the older uh, colonial buildings in the center of Mexico City, you'll see that uh, you'll occasionally find uh, a stone that uh, on one side has an Aztec deity, on the other side is a paving stone for a colonial courtyard. This happens all of the time, all of the time. And indeed, you know, the pre-Hispanic Mesoamerican peoples did this too. Yeah. Um, Jane Rattery had asked a question in the chat here, for what purpose was the Codex Mendoza commissioned? The Codex Mendoza, we think, was commissioned to communicate to Philip II, then King of Spain, something about his new kingdom. Uh, if we are right and associate the codex known today as the Codex Mendoza with the codex that we have information about from the early uh, colonial period uh, government records uh, in Mexico City. We know that the uh, Antonio Mendoza, the first viceroy uh, of New Spain as uh, most of Mexico and parts of Central America and much of what today is the US Southwest was known, uh, we know from documents that he commissioned a manuscript to be sent to the king, which was going to give him some idea of this place. The Codex Mendoza that we have has three sections. The first section goes through the history of Tenochtitlan and the Aztec emperors from the founding of the city to the conquest. The second section 
is uh, economic. It lists all of the subsidiary states, that is those who had been conquered by the Aztec empire and under each state, it gives the tribute that that state had to pay to the capital and the um, timeline for the tribute. So you've got history, you've got economy, and the last section is uh, all about the Aztec life, uh, what happens at birth, what happens as the child grows up, boy, girl, education, this, that, and the other, and so forth. Uh, even coming to the end, the last page of it is wonderful because it shows people, uh, seniors, uh, I guess I would be in that group, who, because they're old, they're allowed to drink as much pulque as they want. So you have these, this old man and this old lady who are drunk and their children trying to get them to stand up. It's really rather amusing. That's great. Um, why don't we have, we'll finish with this question here before we pull Vin in for a conversation uh, between uh, you and Vin and the, and the participants. Uh, Paul Connick follows up uh, about the manuscripts. You mentioned manuscripts have been destroyed. Do we know the details? Was it intentional? And if so, by whom, when, and why? Uh, it, it was intentional. We know quite a bit. Um, many of the manuscripts were destroyed by uh, the early uh, missionaries because they wanted to uh, remove every trace of pre-Hispanic religion uh, to make it easier to convert. Uh, the indigenous peoples to Christianity. And we have um, quite a bit of information about major programs of book burning, if you will. Uh, one figure who is very closely associated with that is a Franciscan missionary by the name of Diego de Landa, uh, Fray Diego, who famously uh, destroyed mountains of Maya manuscripts in the Yucatan uh, in the 1540s. So yeah, uh, the, the, the missionaries and the state wanted to uh, make people forget. Great. Well, um, thank you for that. That is uh, me sad, you know, and, and unfortunately this erasure, like I said, there's more stuff erased from the past than we have uh, then we have preserved for sure. And, and it's unfortunate, much of it has been intentionally erased for us as well. Um, and we continue to do it. <laughs> yes, we certainly do, absolutely. And uh, the more I'm just uh, getting on my high horse, the more that we don't value the humanities and the preservation of the past, the, the better the risk we have. So I'll throw that little political piece out there. 